the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own senate ring and with the senate of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no magicians, magicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel answered to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children and their wives and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they, were, before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and his works, signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. For this, Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Ends our scripture reading. Amen. Amen. Let's pray once again as we commend ourselves to God. Our Father who is in heaven, we come before your throne, <coughs> Lord, once again acknowledging who you are, the great I am, the only true and living God, the God, as we have read, who rescues his people. The God who delivers his people from snares. Indeed, God, you have delivered us when we are captives, enslaved, in sin. But yet, Lord, the power of the gospel, by the help of God, the Holy Spirit, broke those chains and we were set free. We can now have the occasion this afternoon to praise your name. Praising you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Freedom not to continue to sin, but freedom to righteousness, that we might live ever to please you, ever to glorify your great name. Our Father, we acknowledge that uh, we do come short of uh, the purpose for which you served us. And therefore we ask for forgiveness, but also we ask for your grace to multiply in us. Lord, help us that we might have this desire, desire to please only yourself, desire to honor yourself, 
desire to love you and serve you all the days of our lives. Our Father, forbid it that we may be, we, we, we may shipwreck our faith. Forbid it, Lord, that the, the things of this world may, may lure us to abandon yourself for them. We plead, our Father, because this is quite clear, not only in the times past, even in our days, that we have so many casualties. Lord, forbid it that we may be numbered among such. It is not in our power that we will triumph. The reason why, Lord, we seek your face. We seek you earnestly, that, Lord, we might not bring shame to your name, nor drag your name in the mud as we live for ourselves, as we live to gratify self. Forbid it, Lord, that we may forget Gethsemane, that we may forget the agony of our Savior on the cross, that we may forbid it, that we may forget what he did for us. Father who is in heaven, continue giving thanks for the privilege on this Lord's Day to gather with the saints. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of fellowship and the privilege to interact with those that you have said, the, the elect of God. We pray for your aid as we worship you as a community of believers. And Lord, hear these our offerings to you. We know that um, we cannot repay the salvation that we have known in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And But yet we, we want to bring the token of our sincere love to you in, in, in praising your great name. Our Father in heaven, we pray that may you minister to us as we will be hearing and listening to your word. Lord, we want to change and be like your son. We want to grow in loving our God and loving our neighbor. Lord, we want to grow in renewing our minds that we might have that biblical worldview in everything. And that, Lord, we might continue to mortify, to put off sin and to kill it and to put on righteousness. As we have prayed Unless you do this for us, these efforts will not heal it. It is our prayer. We we'll make it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I ask that we sing uh, 451. 451. Uh, that speaks of the church. 451. One, the church is one foundation. And may we rise to our feet as we as we sing uh, this song. The church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ our Lord? He is His new creation by water. Oh, we can't scorn for one. 
turn to Titus, Titus and uh, chapter 1, Titus and chapter 1. one Paul, a born servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me accordingly to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. For a man, for if, a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. In there, um, we've been thinking um, about, the, about where to start from when the church is in a mess, so Paul, um, writing to Titus, uh, this is the counsel and wisdom that he gives him in this epistle. It is to help him think about the job that was ahead of him, the job that uh, he had at hand. So what we saw last time is the fact that we, you, you should, we should start at thinking about the most important things. The most important things is the gospel and salvation. 
that is extremely important. Setiology, as the theologians would, would say, is very important. It is very important. If the church is to get back to a sound spiritual path, the gospel must be consistently preached. And there must be a concern of salvation of its members in the church. When salvation is not an issue, then the church will be off its rails and it will derail as it were. So spiritual success therefore depends on us preaching the gospel and insisting on salvation. Insisting on salvation. You know this, what we saw in, um, in Paul's writing is that there is an absolute need to depend on God. You can preach the gospel, you can insist on salvation, but that does not lie in our power. It lies in the power of God. And the reason why he prays grace and mercy and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is basically saying, the Lord help you. The Lord help you because uh, this is a, is a huge, a huge task. I draw your attention to verse 5. For this reason, Paul says, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Paul had started to um, attend the work of church plant in Crete. But it looks like there are things that uh, were left hanging. Things that were not left in place. The essential things that were not left in place. He could have gone perhaps for urgent uh, things that came or for things, other demanding things that came up. But it is quite clear that uh, there were essential things in the churches in Crete, in this island, uh, that were missing. And, uh, and as a result, there were other things that went wrong. I think largely we would say or generally the matters that went wrong are matters of doctrine and matters of uh, church practice or matters of godliness. Uh, you, can, you can feel or you can read uh, those hints um, as, we read, as I read chapter 2 for instance and verse 1. But as for you speak things which are proper for sound doctrine. It could have been that this was a huge issue. But also chapter 1, verse 10, for it says, For there are many insubordinate, both idol talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. Okay, um, there It is clear there was uh, ungodliness, ungodliness among a certain class of people whose mouth, he says, must be stopped, who pervert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. These men were teaching for the sake of dishonest gain. So, the question is where do we start from, or where do we start off from to straighten that which in the church has gone wrong. So apart from insisting on the most important things or thing, which is the gospel and salvation, we see the second thing that the Apostle Paul says must be brought on board. And this is church order. Church order by ordaining or by appointing godly leaders in the church. Okay, this is what we see once again, verse four, verse five. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint. He says, and appoint elders 
in every city that is every on the island of Crete, as I commanded, as I commanded you. I think it must be Ted Donnelly who says that the church order is like a conduit by which godliness flows. Without church order, there will be chaos in the church of Jesus Christ. So he insists you must appoint godly leaders. Every church is very clear. Every church needs resident elders that will lead the affairs of the church. These must not just be elders without godliness. Paul is insisting in those qualifications you can tell these are godly leaders. These are godly elders. And he insists appoint elders in every city as I commanded and he, and he tells how they should look like, how their godliness should look like. If a man is blameless, that's what he says, the husband of one wife, Having, a, having, having uh, faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. And he goes on and on to catalog. Catalog his, uh, the, the, what describes a godly man, his, his, his public reputation, his sexual purity or domestic competence as it is seen in his in his morality at home and as it is seen in his leadership with his uh, family or as it is seen in his personal character he must not be self-willed a selfish guy or a guy who is quick tempered not given to one not violent and not greedy for money he must have the ability they must have the ability to teach sound doctrine, as Paul states. So it is very clear that the, each church, each church must have resident elders, resident godly leaders, resident godly leaders. So the first thing we must be doing I make this as an application. The first thing that we must be doing in church plan, because I think that this is Paul's, these are Paul's works. Uh, this is the church, the churches that he planted and he left them uh, hanging as it were. And therefore it, he gives us a pattern of how we go about church plant. So the first thing that we must do in church plan, when establishing a church, is to look for godly men. It's to look for godly men. Or when the church is in, in, in chaos, we, apart from parameter number one, asking is the gospel being preached here? Is there salvation in the general membership? We ask the second question. Let's see the elders. Are the elders godly men? If not, the reason why we have chaos. The reason why the church is lies in, in ruin. So I'm insisting, therefore, uh, that uh, you cannot uh, plant a church, for instance, by first ordaining deacons. Because that's, that's, that's really working in reverse, isn't it? Paul is very clear. What was missing, what was lacking was elders, not deacons was elders because the 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 um, the, the office that is a office, office of leadership is that of of elders as i said you cannot plant a church by first setting up office of deacon before that of elder if you do that the deacons by default will start to function as elders. And if we bring elders, guess what will happen? A fight will begin. Because others will be saying, look, what's wrong with the paper? Functions. 
We are the bona fide office bearers. Either they will not say it, but you can tell in the way they will be relating one with the other that there will be a fight unless those are serious godly men. There will be harmony. But that is not the case. Paul is very wise. Paul is very wise in insisting for this reason I left you in prayer that you should set in order things that are lacking which things I think apart from what we have said is the appointing of elders. The appointing of elders. A church plant must not be left if it is begins without an elder. It must not be left for too long without a godly leadership. Otherwise, the wheels, the spiritual wheels will go off. It will lose direction and it will career off and before long there will be in the church will be in a mess. The church will be in a mess. One of the reasons for insisting obviously for setting the elders as as the first thing that must be put in place, that which was uh, not straight, is because of the, 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 the godly example that the elders will give that church. You insist on the gospel, you insist on, on salvation, but Paul says that uh, you know how the, do you know, do you, can, can you demonstrate to young believers how the gospel looks like in person? How do you personify the gospel? How do you describe the gospel on two legs? It is through its leadership. Through its leadership. The gospel is observable on two legs through godly elders. So you can insist the gospel, the gospel, salvation, the salvation, but how does it look like? One of the things that I keep on stating and calling out here is one of the things that I get frustrated about is how to implement the things that we know, the things that I know. If there is no example, it is difficult. It's difficult. And this, therefore, you get frustration. I know that I should be parenting my kids, but how? Is there any godly example where this parenting is, is clearly spelled out in its biblical uh, frame or framework? And that's the insistence. I'm getting a feedback, so I think that is quite irritating to the congregation, isn't it? Can you get the feedback? Somebody can help out? <coughs> Apart from the fact that these elders will give a godly example, they are a guide to the church in matters of faith, or they should be a guide to the church in matters of faith and matters of conduct. Well, I want to ask this question. How do you appoint these godly men? Because that's what you read in verse 5. For this reason, I left you in prayer that you should set in order things that are lacking and appoint Elders. So firstly, I want us to consider the appointment of these elders. Under this head, notice the elders as office. Or notice the office. Appoint elders. Who are these? Apart from the fact that I've said they are godly men, who are these godly men?
the elders or presbyters was a word that was used in the early church for a for a older man or a man that was old in age and later on that word was adopted officially in the church to mean a mature leader so if you read the old testament you hear moses calling the elders Okay, so what started as um, older men now became officially as mature leaders were called elders. The, the maturity here is not in, in just age, age, physical age. It is in terms of faith. So it is, it is Paul is basically saying appoint mature men. Appoint mature men or appoint godly men. Let me put it that way. So Paul uses this same word elsewhere, but uses it um, in, interchangeably with the other two words which I, the word uh, overseer or bishop or pastor or shepherd, he uses them in the similar manner. So appoint elders, he uses, for instance, in verse, uh, we read in verse 7, for a bishop. If you have a footnote uh, or other versions, literally will mean for an overseer. So when he says appoint elders, he means appoint overseers or appoint bishops, which is their literal function. They are, they are like supervisors, their literal function. But he also uses the other word, which is pastor or shepherd, which is their figurative term for the, what they do, like the shepherds or like the farmer who shepherds, who leads the flock. Um, so, whether he uses elder, whether he uses overseer, whether he uses bishop, whether he uses uh, pastor or shepherd, he is saying the same thing. Appoint godly leaders. Appoint mature leaders. And this, obviously, we will we have seen it in several places. Uh, I want you to turn to a place where he uses three of them. One as a verb, but at least it gives us occasion to see those three used at the same time in Acts and chapter 20. Acts and chapter 20. Verse 28 says, Therefore take heed to yourselves, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased by his blood. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me start from verse 17. Just reading 17 so that you, the people that Paul is addressing at Ephesus, in 17, we are told from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for elders. These are the people he's addressing. Elders. Presbyter or presbytos of the church. And 28, he says to these men, to these elders, elders, therefore, take heed to yourselves as elders and to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you Episcopos or episcopos, which the church has made you overseer, which is the same word as a bishop. Okay? And he uses the verb to shepherd. To shepherd, which is the verb, same verb we use as 
to pastor, but um, here it is a verb and not a, a noun. So he uses those three, three words. Elders, overseers, and pastor. I think that it is, it is uh, important just to mention once again that that is why we have sought here to insist that all elders must be addressed this by the same by the same title so if you feel it uncomfortable to call a uh, brother uh, mr chanda as pastor then you must learn okay you, you know ch what change is all about change is about repeating just repeat one year from now you will get used it is a habit. We have grown with this habit that uh, there, are, there are pastors in the church. There is a pastor in the church and there are elders in the church. We insist from the language of the Apostle Paul, appoint elders, appoint overseers, appoint bishops, appoint pastors. It's the same word used. So if you feel uncomfortable to call me elder, you will get used by just repeating. If you call me elder, elder that you will get used soon and throw away the word pastor. That will be okay. <clears throat> Second, appoint elders. We've seen the office to which they should be appointed. But second, the procedure. The procedure. I want to acknowledge that this procedure sounds as if it is a, it is a physical, um, flesh uh, procedure and it is all done by one man. Let's go back to that text in Titus. For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded. So it sounds as if Paul is saying, You, Titus, as an individual, go in each church in Crete and uh, look for elders and, uh, and uh, hand pick them and set them as uh, elders or as bishops. That's how it sounds. I want, I want to state quickly that it sounds as if it is a physical or one-man thing, but this is a spiritual exercise that uh, is firstly, first and foremost is not a human being business. It is God, the Holy Spirit's business to appoint I think that we, we went to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. It is clear that there we heard, therefore, when Paul is saying, therefore, take heed to yourselves, the elders, to the flock, among which not a human being made you overseer. He says, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. To shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. It is very clear. This is a spiritual activity, and it is God, the Holy Spirit, who appoints. You read in the... In, in this first Corinthians or second Corinthians about the, the, the gifts that the, in chapter 12. The same, the same, the same person who or being who works these gifts or who gives us these gifts. It's not human beings. But let me read the, the Acts and chapter 13. Acts and chapter 13. I think we read this in the morning. Um, so let me read it again. Uh, 13 verse 1. 
And in the church that was at Antioch, there was a certain, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, or Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Namena, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and so, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit, notice, it is the Holy Spirit who said what? Now, set for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. The one who sets or the one who appoints is God. Specifically, God the Holy Spirit. We are told, um, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, uh, they sent them away. In verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Lucius. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. I'm insisting that when Paul says uh, appoint elders, he is not in any way saying that this is in your flesh, this is in disregard to the one who gives gifts, it is, uh, it is in your power, go it alone and appoint. No, this is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. So he must, be, he must be aware of this very fact as he do the, the, the work. In fact, uh, in fact secondly, uh, the fact that we approach it with prayer and fasting is a is clear indication. This is a spiritual exercise. We are beckoning and we are beseeching God, the Holy Spirit, to... to uh, to to lead in this work, um, in the work of appointing elders. Um, this is that what we saw in verse 3, verse 3 of chapter 13. Then having fasted and prayed. For what reason? If it is just a, a man's job, would wake up one morning and say, uh, we will ordain you this morning. Why fast? Why waste time? Why pray? This is a spiritual exercise. It is a work of God, the Holy Spirit. We must depend on him. Otherwise, in seeking to do what is right, we'll be making the situation worse. In trying to sort out what is, uh, is gone wrong in the church. We'll be making the situation worse. Listen to what he says in chapter 14 of Acts and verse 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with, with fasting, then they commended uh, the Lord in whom they had believed. Okay, that's the approach. But but also thirdly is that this is a spiritual exercise. You can see it from the scripture prescription of the qualification. Okay, which we'll be considering later, not 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 today. Uh, when he says appoint elders in every city, I commanded. He gives the guideline. If it was left to Timothy or to Titus, they would have had their own measurement, their own guide to who qualifies as an elder. But this is the work of God. The, the breathed out word of God must specifically describe or state what would be the qualifications. So, the appointment there is not one clever man who has uh, everything in him 
who can discern who is an who is a godly man in this church and he says i think you it is a work of the holy spirit it is a work of god i want to state further that the procedure is not just a spiritual exercise it is a it is a congregational exercise it's a congregation exercise and it is here that um, i would uh, i would lean on on, on, on men that have gone uh, before me. I want to state firstly from the Confession of Faith uh, in Article 26 and Paragraph 8 and 9, where we, I read, and it, this is what it says, elders are to be chosen by the common consent and vote of the church. So, the word that he uses, appoint, in this text, used elsewhere, I think, in two other places, in the one we read in Acts, and the other one in 2 Corinthians, which I will read, um, is, is very clear that it denotes choosing. It denotes election, or it denotes electing by raising hands, or vote by stretching out the hands. Albert N. Martin, in that pastoral book that he has published, says the word does not refer to an authoritative imposition of hands on the part of the apostles, but to recognize on the part of the entire body. In other words, that word recognizes a vote of the entire body. It's not one man saying, um, I appoint you now like the way the president does it. You are minister of this, minister of that, minister of the other uh, department. That word connotes that involvement. That usage is well seen in 2 Corinthians. And chapter chapter eight. Chapter eight. Let <clears throat> me read from um, reading from verse sixteen. But thank be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you on his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also, that word used, chosen, is a word appointed. He was appointed by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. The, 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 that is the same word that is, is, is used in Titus. It is the word to, to choose, to elect, and it is, it is in the wider context, the body, the churches, who also chose by the churches to travel with us with these gifts. That is the usage of that word. Let me borrow principles in that procedure of congregational exercise of participation because I think it is in three occasions that uh, the, the choosing of, of apostles is used, the choosing of, of deacons and I think in one occasion uh, of elders which is uh, not so direct but that we can draw principle from 
what we see, how that procedure, that congregational exercise can be done. In Acts, I'll read the Acts of the Apostles once again. Acts of the Apostles, I will read uh, quickly. Uh, this text is well known. Chapter 1. So we have 120 participating. 120. Okay, so I read in 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a party in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field. It goes on. Let me jump and go to verse uh, 21. Therefore, of these men, he says, they want to replace um, the same man he's talking about, Judas. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and among us, beginning from um, the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must be a witness with us in his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called uh, Basabas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias, and they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas has, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots. That's the participation. And they cast lots. And the lot fell on Matthias or Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. You, you you can tell from the from 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 uh, the way they approached all this. At every turn, it was God involved, and uh, nonetheless, there was this participation of the congregation in the choosing, in the vote. It doesn't matter how that vote was done, whether it was by show of hands, okay, how many are for, how many are, and, and, what, and, and so on and so forth. But at least we can see that participation. We see that same participation in when they are choosing the, the, the deacons. I said we are drawing a principle. Okay, this is very clear. We have read this time and time again. Let me read, it. Let me read this text from verse 3. Therefore, brethren, set... Out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So the elders or the apostles are not going to, to fish out by themselves. There is the, 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 the common involvement or there is the suffrage of the body of Christ. And we are told um, there that we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And uh, the saying please the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. They chose Stephen, the body of Jesus Christ. Chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procolas, Nicona, Timon, Phineas, and Nicholas, and the proselyte from Antioch. The point I want to insist is there was a congregational participation in the church as they approached uh, this, this matter. So whether these names are nominated by the church members or brought by the elders at uh, the end of the day, 
there must be first and foremost biblical qualification and um, there must be recognition of the men that must take office. The eldership will take the lead, no doubt about that. Uh, as, as we read in, in Timothy, uh, with respect to the deacons, for instance, uh, let me just read that text, uh, First Timothy and chapter 3, um, uh, after he has given all those qualifications, he says in verse 10, but let these also be first tested. So it's not just uh, uh, we, we, we are participating as a congregation, but we need this one. There must be an examination. There must be a close inspection of these men that must take office. But what I, what I want you to note further, these appointments came from within the church. They came from within the church. From uh, When he says appoint elders, Paul didn't go outside. It is the body of Christ at Crete, in various churches at Crete. Men and women the, who made those churches are the ones who participated. And we see that in Jerusalem. We see that in Lystra and Iconum when they are bringing in elders. It is from within. Appoint elders from within the church. That procedure we see finally the laying on of hands, the official setting apart after that all has been done. Let me summarize it this way. What we see there is uh, election and ordination. That's the procedure. Election and ordination. That's the simple procedure. The elders taking the lead in the process. Because remember, they're the ones who are coming. Timothy Titus is to lead. Timothy is to lead. The apostles at Jerusalem were to be the leaders, they are to sound the qualification, they are to state clearly who they need at, in chapter 6 of Acts. The elders must take the lead. They know the need and they know the number, they know the qualifications and are responsible uh, therefore that godly men are brought in not without the common suffrage, not without the participation, the congregational or congregation participation. That is very important to state. But let me state also, finally, as I make my observ few observations, is in the procedure that they are to appoint, not one elder. Notice the language, it is in plural. Appoint elders. Appoint Elders. The appointment of elders is not is is in the is not one but in the plural. And uh, plurality, as we have learned in the studies that we had, assumes assumes parity and equality. Let me state that again. Otherwise, if there is no equality, plurality does not exist. So when he says appoint elders, these elders, these overseers, these pastors, these shepherds are to be at the same level, at par. Otherwise, the plurality will be negated. How can you be equal to one who is less in power? Plurality assumes equality. Otherwise, as I've said, it defeats the whole purpose. Let me make observation. The first observation I've made 
is that the procedure of uh, appoint elders is to always be election and followed by ordination. The church cannot be left behind. It's congregational. As I say, it doesn't matter whether the nominations come first from there or they come first from the elders. Nonetheless, it is congregation. But second, the second important point that I want to make is that men must be known. You cannot, you cannot appoint elders. They were being appointed from within. They were known men. And one of the reasons is very clear from the qualification. The, the, the first of it, when he says in verse 6, if a man be blameless, that a man be blameless is of good report or is of public good reputation, if I may put it that way. He has, he has, he has a reputation in the congregation, first and foremost, before he has a reputation out there. He must be known. I ask, would you be willing to be, to be pastored by a stranger who doesn't know you and who you don't know? Would you be willing, brethren? We, we have a tendency of wanting to get people from there and leaving men who we know here Men of good reputation, men of good personal character, men of domestic competence. If we know they have a flaw, we can work on that flaw and uh, we will be competent. But we always think the man out there is so qualified because we don't know him. We don't know him. Paul insists, a point it must be from within. A man, Paul, the apostles would say, who has been from the time of John the Baptist till now. A man we have known. You see, if we get someone from outside, which is the tendency when we are looking for so-called pastor, we go outside. I think that's an anomaly, first and foremost. If we do that, the point is that we must be acquainted with them. Otherwise, they do not qualify to have a, 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 a man who is blameless. Do we know their reputation out there? Or because he has preached three, four, five, six sermons that we are all happy. And, and that's, that's how um, human beings are, isn't it? We... We, when, when a new guy comes and because he's been preparing these sermons for years and, and your pastor is one week and he's looking like he's rusting and the man preaches, ah, mukali, mukali. Mukali, you guys, nice, mukali. I think let's have him as, as our elder. Very soon you will see his wheels coming off. Because those sermons he prepared are now over. It is him and kama. You know, it is him kama. He's now sounding like a broken record. There are men seated here who can be our pastors. Here. We know them. They have good reputation. We know their management, domestic management. Brethren, we get so familiar with one another and we we, we, we are so excited. It, it, that, that's what happens across life, isn't it? Those who want to marry want to surprise us, young people. They want to get women from out there. Out there. Of good reputation. Here we'll be saying, well, what we can see is a Cinderella, isn't it? When you look, we can see a Cinderella. Very good looking. But that's all we know. When you live with that woman, and then it dawns on you 
Dar de a care putea? Este rău. Look, e o vroie de marit. You need to learn. <laughs> to live. <laughs> to live with a knife. You need to learn. Ok? You need to learn. All those edges you need to never, never, as what they call, never, 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 ah, it's so navigate, yes. It's a knife, so you need to navigate properly, otherwise you cut yourself. Learn to appreciate men. It's, it's, God is not demanding for perfection. We will not find a perfect fellow, even as elders. We will not find perfect partners as we look for marriage. We will not find perfect mates as we go into the mission field. Appreciating the reputation of these men and women is very, very important. Very, very important. We can grow. That is what Paul says. We can grow men. That's what Paul says. The, 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 the only qualification that we have is that they must be faithful men. That's it. And we can grow them here. Yeah. I'm saying this because when we think about missions, brethren, we must not go the route of calling somebody from out there and the church is forced to vote and they vote and they send this person into the mission field and he goes and fails. It's because he is being chosen from where? From outside. If he is chosen from outside, we must get, he must get acquainted with us. We must, we must know his grace, his graces, his gifts, his godliness. In fact, I think that we must invite him on the eldership to serve there, perhaps for one year, perhaps for two years. So that men and women, we, as we send them, as they sent those missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, they were men of Good reputation. We must not fall in the trap of calling any Jim and Jack. This office, Paul says, is what will set straight what is in the mess. Brethren, we must approach it with a lot of caution. As I said, there is nobody, nobody here who is perfect, and that is not what Paul is calling for. He's calling for a good report. A good report. An elder who says, look, uh, forgive me, brother, I've, I've wronged you. That's a good report. That's a good report. If you say, no, no, but you see, I'm dead of our one, you know, he'll come back. That is a good report. But lastly, the observation that I make, appoint elders. Paul is very specific. Each church or elders are for a specific church. Appoint elders, he says, in every city as I commanded you. Let me end here. Amen. As that we rise to our feet as we sing. Two eight nine two eight nine. I know that why heaven is
is done, no tongue can breathe it and depart. No tongue can beat me, let's depart. When Satan turns me to despair, I tell the Lord that you'll be there. I want to look and see him there, who made an end of all my sin. Because the sin left, Savior died, my sinful soul is counted spirit, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me, behold him there. Perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is in me, Christ on high. Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is in with Christ on high. Christ my Savior and my Lord, with Christ my Savior and my God. As our brother, Mr. Lumpard, close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks to you this afternoon for the great uh, privilege that you gave to us to sit under the preaching of your word, to remind us of truths, truths that you desire us to embrace, truths that should be our guide as we live as your children that you procured with the blood of your precious son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for these uh, truths. Our prayer, gracious master, is that you may enable us to embrace them. Mm. You may enable us to be guided by them. Even when we feel constrained in a different direction, we may indeed be guided by the sufficiency of what is in your word. Mm. We thank you that you've guided us uh, this afternoon concerning how the church is to be directed, and primarily uh, through the presence and the existence of the church, of, of, the, of the office of elders, of the office of, 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 of pastors, of the office of bishops or overseers. We thank you for the principles that are laid as to who should qualify to occupy that office and the functions that they should, uh, the, the functions that they should execute. We thank you too, even for the responsibility that is placed upon the rest of the church membership. We want to humble ourselves, our master and our king, as we've been guided that these are not offices that should be entered presumptuously. They should not be entered with carelessness. We've been guided that they should be done with fear and trembling, with the guidance of the Spirit of God, because the business thereof is that of, of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We thank you for your servants, whom you have uh, used indeed to deliver these uh, words, which, O oh Lord, we confess, they, they are at times difficult for us to assimilate, having been used to patterns that are different 
But we thank you that you've employed him just to place upon our hearts this truth. We pray, our Father, to the extent that you've constituted us as a local church, that we'll be guided by your holy word to find sufficient men within the local congregation, indeed to have men that super, who will superintend in, in these offices. We thank you and we bless your name that we will, as a men within the local assembly, indeed set ourselves indeed uh, uh, with that challenge that we should stand up and be counted and to serve even as your under shepherds. Mm. Our Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name. Even now, as we uh, separate one from the other, we ask that you dismiss us with your blessing, that these things will preoccupy our mind, even as we face the challenges of the week ahead. Mm -hmm. We ask that when it pleases you, you will gather us once again as your people. We ask for all these things because of your son, whom you love most, even our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. We have come to the end of our gathering. Uh, let me read.